Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Melbourne Press Club. My name is Michael Rowland. I'm a Vice President of the Press Club, and it's great to have your company for this very special event as we farewell the one, the only, John Fain. In fact, uh, so much so, it's a record event. We had trouble squeezing people in. Tickets sold out so quickly. And I'm sure a fair bit of that is people, John, wanting to come along just to make sure you are going. <laughs> Who clapped? Um, but in all seriousness, it's, it's a testament to uh, this man's popularity. He'll be in a conversation with the equally fabulous Mary Girin, my colleague from ABC News, a bit later on. But I do want to uh, say a few words at the start, having dealt with John for, for many years. And I firstly want to congratulate John for yesterday's rating success. His audience rose 1.3% to just under 12%, which in radio terms is a good result. And I think, John, the listeners are saying something. It's not too late. Yeah, he's saying yes it is. I'm, I'm not sure, still not sure about your replacement, so it's still time to... Uh, <laughs> joking. Um, but I think he's fairly convinced about uh, his departure. In the 23 years, the 23 years John has presented ABC Mornings, there have been six Victorian Premiers, eight Prime Ministers, that's counting Kevin twice, six State Governors, five Victorian Police Commissioners, three Brisbane Lions Premiership teams, and six ABC Managing Directors. <laughs> I raise that because the last time John was here, I was moderating uh, a lunch with Michelle Guthrie, and some of you might recall John going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Michelle over the ABC at the time, and that didn't end well for Michelle. <laughs> Only one survived that death match. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, in the time I have known John, which is the 23 years plus plus that uh, I've been at the ABC, uh, John, you have been a, a beacon of professionalism and more importantly, a beacon of ABC values. And that is more important now than ever. So I thank you for that as, as a colleague and I I'm, know I'm I speak on behalf of all of the ABC colleagues here today. And at risk of embarrassing him even further, uh, we know he is very widely popular on, on air but he is also deeply valued and respected by his colleagues at ABC Melbourne, and they will very much miss your presence and your guiding advice when you go. So um, uh, thank you for all of the advice you've given me over the years as well. I would also uh, like to thank the uh, sponsors of the Melbourne Press Club, uh, whose support makes it very possible for these lunches, uh, like the ones we're enjoying today, kicking off with our principal sponsors, Monash University, represented by Johan Lindbergh, Johan, good morning to you, or good afternoon to you, and Virgin Australia. Our premium sponsors, Crown Resorts, represented by Ann Peacock, and Minter Ellison, represented today by Lifetime Press Club member Peter Bartlett, and also Commonwealth Bank. And also a very uh, warm thank you to our me major media sponsors and other sponsors as well. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mary Girin will be up here in about 20 minutes' time to have a chat with John in the interim. Please enjoy your main course, and I'll see you a bit later on. Cheers. <laughs> Please keep eating. We're about to be joined by Mary Girin and John Fain, but first, a video presentation. Gloria in Warburton. Morning, Gloria. You're uh, with Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister. Hiya. Mr. Hi, Gloria. Abbott. Hi. I would like to ask you if you'd like your mother or your grandmother to be in my situation. I'm a 67-year-old <coughs> pensioner, three chronic incurable medical conditions, mm -hmm. two life-threatening. Um, I just survive on around $400 a fortnight after yeah. I pay my rent. Mm -hmm. And I work on an adult sex line to make ends meet. Good morning, I'm John Fain in the Melbourne ABC studios. <laughs> You've probably heard quite a few bad things about lawyers lately. In fact, I confess some of them you may even have heard from me. Oh, yeah. oh, John. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. How long have you been working on that gag, John? And it's one of many stories, and I, look, as someone who grew up... Oh, stop crawling. ...of an era... Well, thanks for joining us. That's all there's time for today, but I hope you'll be with us next week when we have a look at the law and sex. Most people wouldn't be seen dead driving around in a car like this, but I love it. 
John and I know each other well enough to know where the line is drawn and to cross it from time to time. Um, I used to point out to him that uh, I understood that he would be shedding much of the audience that I had provided, but that's okay. And good morning, John Fay. Morning, Red. Did you have to pay school fees? I was one of those students who had a Commonwealth scholarship. Did oh. you get one of them? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What do you mean, course? Because I'm really smart. How are we supposed to know that? The way you carry on. Don't you watch television? I'm Australia's third brainiest comedian. According to what? Well, it hasn't been on yet. According to some quiz show? Yeah. No, there's smart and there's smart. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about smart. I'm clever. I'm not smart. Yeah, right. If I was smart, I'd be rich. No, sorry. I'm talking about wise. Let's, let's get back <laughs> wise? to Wise? Oh, oh, forget <laughs> that. You can leave that out, yeah. <laughs> John has craft and efficiency. Um, and one learns to appreciate that more and more after you've been in the business longer and longer and you see lesser people attempting the same thing. He's good at what he does. Good morning, Maureen. Welcome. Good morning, John. I don't know if you welcome me. I've got no empathy whatsoever for the people of Hayfield. Uh, Maureen, wood, what I do... No, 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 I haven't finished. No, you the wood clearly company haven't. goes. The wood <laughs> company goes. Yeah. And that's got a knock-on effect to everybody else that's got a business. Go yeah, on, sure. off you go. Okay, thank you. It's not whether I do or don't have an opinion, Maureen. My job is to think of the uh, most difficult questions that the, uh, the, oh, I know the sceptical listener would want yeah. me to ask and whether, yeah. it's, whether it's this minister or her predecessors from the other side of politics, each side accuses me of being too harsh on their friends and I'm quite happy to plead guilty to being an equal opportunity mongrel. Maureen, I'll give everyone a hard time. It's impossible to imagine this city without John. I mean, we're all going to have to you know, deal with that impossibility and come to imagine other wonderful things. But he's been uh, just integral. He is talking to everybody in this town, from talkback callers to the Premier, um, on a weekly basis. And the Premier, Jeff Kennett, joins me. Good morning to you, Mr Kennett. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm exceptionally well. If I followed yours and John Thwaites and the ALP's view, I'd never get up in the morning. Well, I managed to get up so, in the morning. I'd be so worried, me. so worried that there was a brick going to fall out of the building that I passed at the side. Well, no, that's not the guiding philosophy here, and you will know that, of no, course. Now, rubbish, later today... Rubbish. You're well, it's not rubbish. You're negative. You're Absolutely so, not. You and the ALP are a good partnership. No, it's, it's... Thank God you're not running the state. It's the role of an independent no, broadcaster no, to ask not. questions and no. to no. require answers no. on behalf no. of the but public. You can be positive. You can just have one glimmer of hope in your day that this is going to be a good day, that you're going to take something and create something that is good rather than looking at something and say, how can I make it smaller? How can I shrivel it up? Ten minutes to seven on 774. ABC Melbourne, John Fane with you. Right through the evening with the ABC continuing to provide you with emergency updates for as long as we required on this dreadful Saturday, February the 7th. Like every other Victorian, I remember that day and turned on the radio like everybody else and of course there he was and uh, it, I mean you know he was in there I, I don't know how many hours it was but it uh, might have been 24 it might have been 48 it seemed uh, every time I turned on the radio there he was. John Fane with you in the South Bank studios we have 11 fires under observation across Victoria and the ABC will continue to bring you information throughout the night continuously and into tomorrow. As I'm speaking, the DSE are issuing an urgent threat message for the Murrindindi Mill fire, which is burning in the Mount Disappear State Forest. Uh, I've been answering phones for a couple of hours here, and I can tell you, uh, Rochelle and Greg, uh, there are people ringing up saying, I live in such and such an area and I don't know what to do. A very upsetting text message, King Lake fires, our house has burnt, everyone's hiding at the pub, no fire trucks anywhere. When Jill Ma died, uh, I've never seen um, that, uh, that station in, in, in that way. It was just the saddest, saddest time for everybody in there, clearly. And uh, I remember, I think probably everybody in the city, John's um, beautiful uh, response. And, and that's the kind of thing where you just, you just don't know how somebody is capable of doing something like that. Um, something that is affecting him personally, that is affecting all the people that he works with and cares about so deeply, uh, but he's the one that actually has to sit behind a microphone and talk.
John, good luck. Uh, I'm sure you're going to approach uh, this uh, next phase of your life with the same enthusiasm and uh, attention to detail as you've approached your broadcasting career and uh, it's going to be really exciting. You'll be missed. Uh, thank you. I feel in a sense that what I'm doing now is writing him a reference for whatever he goes on to and I ask myself how well do we ever really know anybody? Good luck. John, I just want to say I admire you so much. All those years working for the ABC, shackled, not allowed to have an opinion, hiding those opinions. And I know now that you want to get them out there. So 96900693, give me a call. Seriously, good luck. Well done. Great career. Enjoy retirement, but do give me a call. Let's welcome to the stage, John Payne. Hello, yes, I'm Mary Gearin. I'm very pleased as a colleague uh, to be in this position and uh, potentially the Inquisitor, along with you, John Fain, of one of his many farewell appearances. It does sound like from the reaction in the room, though, that you weren't aware, perhaps because you enjoyed uh, dressing for radio for so long, that you actually did have quite the televisual career there. Yeah, I had no idea. And it's good to see that Mary Guerin draws a crowd here at the Press Club. Big thank you to Mary for getting people to come along. After three and a half hours of listening to me every day, I've no idea why anybody would want to come to a lunch to hear even more. But thank no, you all no, for no. coming. No, no, no. Let's not have any false modesty. You've got an hour to oh, bang no. on here all yeah, I know. yourself. Yeah, I know. I've no idea what to say. Well, just a couple of questions out of Shy, that video. Shy, retiring. For yeah, yeah, all of Shy those. and retiring. Guide me through the elephant earrings. <laughs> Do you still have them? Uh, no, well, it might be somewhere, but um, I, um, when I was a law student, uh, so I was at Monash University, 75, first year, arts law was the Whitlam dismissal year. Uh, of course, everyone was rebellious. And by the time I finished, you, in, after third year and fourth year, you start applying for what was then called articles of clerkship, where you want to get a job in a law firm. As soon as I got articles, I went off and got my ear pierced at a Christmas party the following couple of months later. Um, the elephant came out of a Christmas bonbon and I thought, oh, what do I do with that? So I put it on my sleeper in my infected earlobe. Everyone here with pierced ears will identify with that. Uh, and the blue elephant and I were constant companions. And the first day I turned up for work on at Barker Hearty in 459 Collins Street. Uh, my uh, principal was the senior partner, Jack Hearty. He was the president of the Law Institute. He wore a three-piece suit, including a button-up waistcoat with a gold watch chain. He uh, produced a set of pliers from the desk drawer and said, where's the earring? We're ready for you. Um, I wasn't stupid enough to turn up to work wearing the, the blue elephant earring, but I would put it on on weekends. Several years later, the little blue loop on the elephant broke and a friend of mine gave me wise counsel and said, don't replace it. So <laughs> I didn't, but it was there for a while and I, um, the vision you saw there, I, haven't, I had no idea that was being made. So well, well done, whoever's ambushed me with that, well done. And there's stuff there, I've no idea how, where you found it and I don't even remember doing half of it, but... Um, when I was at the Law Report, so I was a commercial lawyer for four years and then I was at Fitzroy Legal Service for three. And at Fitzroy Legal Service, I brought the elephant back out and started wearing it because it was a great way of forcing people to confront their, their perceptions of what it was to be a lawyer. Um, in fact, I think there are a couple of newspaper articles about the elephant. And I even wore it to court and that raised a few eyebrows. And then when I went to the ABC to do the Law Report, 89, 90, 91, 92, when I joined the ABC 30 years ago, I was occasionally wearing the elephant if, if it was going to kind of um, have an effect, which is, which is what I wanted it to do. So is it coming out on Monday? Huh. I could wear it on Friday. I probably, I'd have to try and make the whole work again, you know. <laughs> you might have some volunteers. <laughs> Now, another part... We could auction that off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you might not have been anticipating also uh, your 
colleague, your peer, your rival, Neil Mitchell. Yeah, I don't think he's in the audience today. No, he sent me a message apologising. He's got some other appointment. So I might say um, that's almost the first time Neil's had something kind to say about me. So <laughs> uh, I should reciprocate and say uh, I joined the ABC 30 years ago. I'm not sure how many years he's been doing his show, but I know it's a few years more than I've been doing the morning show because he was doing it a few years before I started. Um, he made my life hell for a lot of that time early on. Um, it was their practice, as it still is at 3AW, to say to people, if you go on Fane's show, we won't have you back at 3AW, which was a great way of locking up talent, and that's one of the games people play. Um, we have a few tricks up our sleeve too, but uh, it's been, I think, a respectful rivalry, and clearly, you know, he's uh, a great marathon runner too in, in his shift, and what we do, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle and uh, to survive that long and to avoid the sort of Sydney shock jock um, pitfalls, you know, I mean, to end up corrupt and unethical as, for instance, Alan Jones has been shown to be over and over again. Did I mention that Alan Jones has, in fact, been found by a broadcasting tribunal after a full inquiry and full representation to be corrupt and unethical? And I might have already mentioned that Alan Jones has been found to be corrupt and unethical a few times, but... <laughs> It astonishes me, and the Melbourne sensibility for talk radio is the complete antidote to Sydney commercial radio sensibility, and I think that's a credit to the commercial operators in this town. When, when 3RW brought Stan Zmanik down here, it was an absolute failure. It was a complete flop. Melbourne just turned its back on 3RW, and that came as a real shock to them. Uh, we don't have a lot in common. Their values are different to our values. We, the technology is the same, but other than that, you know, not that much. But... You know, I know how hard he must have worked and I, I salute him for that. And yet I have it on very good authority that you refuse to call yourself a journalist. Is that right? I've never studied journalism. I've never been an accredited journalist. Obviously, I do journalism. There's no doubt about it. But my professional qualifications are an arts degree, a law degree and a certificate too in fitting and turning at Northern Mel <laughs> Metropolitan Institute of TAFE. Um, but it I does lead to the question, what do you think is wrong with journalists? Nothing wrong with it at all, but I'm, I guess it's the lawyer in me because you, you can't pass yourself off as something you're not. And I recognise that studying and being accredited and being a journalist is a discreet and important thing in the community. And obviously I do journalism, but you can't say, oh, well, I know a bit about law, so I'll call myself a lawyer. You have to have qualifications and accreditation. So I guess it's a recognition of the accreditation process rather than a diminution of its importance. I don't do the John Laws, oh, I'm just an entertainer bullshit. That's, you know, that's about as bad as being corrupt and unethical. But in fact, I think he was one of those named as corrupt and unethical, along with a few others too. Did I mention that, Al anyway, so uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a put down of journalism. It's in fact, any, it's the opposite. It's putting it on a pedestal and saying, yes, it's important that people study it, learn it and know how to do it. And yet, obviously, you've, and, and you've made it clear through your comments there, but you've also said that uh, the populists, the liars, the racists and fanatics are putting democracy through an unprecedented stress test. Yep. That's when it comes to the media, I think you're talking about in particular. What would be the one thing that you would do to change the media landscape then, to change that? I think the most important and pressing concern is to cut away the nonsense from the pirates who run some of the big new tech companies that they're not publishers. Undoubtedly, they're publishers and they're avoiding accountability for what they publish by pretending they're not publishers. And they are. There's just no doubt about it. And the idea that you can be anonymous online and you can say the most appalling things and not be held to account in any way is just ridiculous. So at the, you've pinched that line from the Stephen Murray Smith Memorial Lecture at the State Library the other week, and it's my favourite analogy at the moment, that in 1895 when Daimler and Benz perfected the internal combustion engine and applied it to the horseless carriage to create a motor car and it transformed our society. It took another 10 to 15 years for the rules to develop about who could drive, licences, registration, regulation of the road rules and eventually the concept of motor insurance. It took years for those to develop. Well, we've now got similar society changing technology and we're trying to catch up with the rules, the regulatory framework to go with it. And it's lagging and it's taking far too long. 
And ironically, the self-interested bullshit that we're getting from the people who run some of these new media empires is exactly the same as when Henry Ford argued that there shouldn't be road rules because that would inhibit the growth of the new technology. It was nonsense then and it's nonsense now and it's got to be called out for what it is. And that's the wider picture. And as I think we've mentioned before, Michael mentioned, you haven't been shy about criticising the ABC as well from within. Oh, it, really? Yeah, that's right. As you leave... Is Michelle here? No, is she no. still under a table potentially no. somewhere yep. behind the bar? She's um, still shopping, I think, yeah. When... Well, how much... I think we paid her $2 million. Is anyone in the room able to confirm or contradict that settlement? Anybody? That's the rumour. How extraordinary... For a board that sacked her and said, but we have absolutely checked, we have no legal liability whatsoever, she's not got anything other than her contractual entitlement, all done and dusted, see you later, Michelle. And then they end up settling for what's rumoured to be several million dollars later. It begs a question, as you leave the ABC, though, do you think that the ABC is in safe hands and is it, is it in any safer position overall? There's no one in the room who loves the ABC more than I do. I don't care how much you love the ABC. I've given 30 years of my life to it. Um, I do think it's in safe hands. I think the board's got some questions to answer, but the management, I think, are pretty good these days. And I acknowledge there are several managers, including previous managers, who are in the room. And I, I, I apologise to each and every one of you for all the terrible things I've said and done over the years and the mess are you've you, had to clean up. Are you really up. sorry? You're apologising, but are you really sorry? No, nah, not really. <laughs> Um, I was told recently that I'm, I'm um, the most complained about person at the ABC and I don't apologise for that, I wear it as a badge of honour because it means you're getting a reaction uh, and I might say these complaints are almost never upheld, it just, it's provoking a reaction from people, it's making people connect and it's making people care and I don't apologise for doing that at all. If anything, I think the risk to the ABC now is, if anything, it could become too bland because it doesn't want to upset people and I think the ABC has to be a bit more mongrel, if anything. Are you talking about the political environment there for the ABC? I don't care I, whether it's uh, attacking people who preach from the pulpit of political correctness, which needs to be examined, whether it's looking at culture, whether it's looking at politics, whether it's looking at sport, whether it's looking at anything. Our job is to, you know, put the blowtorch to people. That's the only reason we exist, surely. And if we can't do that because we're scared people might complain about us, well, we may as well turn everything off and shut the doors and turn out the lights, and I'd hate to see that happen. We have to have management that's robust, that backs the people who make the television, radio and online content and says, no, they're doing their job and if it's upset people, I mean, I'm not talking about extremities, I'm just talking about really good, hard, holding power to account, cutting edge, provocative content, that's what we have to be doing. And you look at some of the things that we've been producing recently, um, that, that show where they, you know, things you, you can ask us, what's it called? Um, you, you can't, can't ask, ask that. that. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, no one else would do that sort of stuff. And you look at what McAuliffe or Charlie Pickering are doing. I mean, that's fabulous on television and on radio. You know, I mean, I don't want to turn on the radio and listen to stuff that's anodyne and bland and, you know, you could hear anywhere. I want to hear something distinctive, something unique and something that challenges me. And I don't care whether it's... Uh, national networks, local radio networks, and we've just been on a big trip where we drove up to the Northern Territory to visit our eldest son who lives in Arnhem Land, and I would hit local ABCs as I went, and I think it's great that the ABC is investing more in regional coverage. The only thing I'm worried about is the, 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 the calibre and the quality. Um, some of the people are very new, and some of it's very bland, and I want to see it get better. And that's what I attack Michelle Guthrie over. I just said, I want us to be better. You've got to be out there as our champion. We've got to do better. We've got to be led better. We've got to be making better content. That's all. Otherwise, what are we there for? And when you talk about blowtorch, and the blowtorch you have to take with politicians, and Michael read out the shopping list of prime ministers, for instance, that you've been through, are they getting better in those 30 years? How has that situation gotten better or worse? And how would you rate our current prime minister, Scott Morrison, when it comes to comparison with previous Prime Ministers in that art. How great ScoMo! <laughs> Look, I haven't had a lot to do with him. I've met with him privately but once and he was charming. Uh, he is obviously very good at marketing 
and I hope that he understands how important the ABC is and he has a passion for what the ABC can do for Australia and he understands the need to invest in it. I know some of his colleagues and certainly people who are senior in the Liberal Party, their default setting is to hate the ABC and to want to weaken the ABC and remove as much of its funding base as possible whenever they have the opportunity. And I've had that said to me time and time again over 30 years by senior uh, Liberal politicians and ex-politicians, including those reminiscing after they've been in power saying, oh, we missed an opportunity to cut you guys down to size. And, um, you know, I think that's a really dangerous mindset. Uh, Richard Alston commissioned an inquiry into the ABC when the Howard government were first elected. Uh, Bob Mansfield, former head of Optus, McDonald's, he was commissioned to do the Mansfield inquiry. He went around Australia looking at the, uh, the ABC, consulting with people everywhere, and he came back. And I know this firsthand from Richard Alston. He slapped his report down on Richard Alston's table and he said, Here's my report, you do whatever you like to the ABC, but if you're gonna cut it, you don't do that in my name. And here's the former boss of Optus and McDonald's who said to Richard Alston, I've never seen brand loyalty like I've discovered for the ABC. So you do whatever you wanna do, but you don't say you're doing it because I recommended it, because I don't. I think you just dodged the question about dodging questions though. Who's the worst? Who's, who's been the worst question dodger, the one whose technique with you really irritated you? Is that TV still? The Jeff Kennett experience <laughs> over many years. So I started the morning show in 1997. Jeff was in his prime. The only instruction I was given for the show was don't get the Premier offside. Um, <laughs> don't know what happened there. Uh, he, he, was, um, he was a handful. I mean, come on. Anybody who was around as a working journalist back then knows that, uh, you know, you didn't contradict Jeff Kennett, you didn't get in his way. Um, sometimes he behaved a bit like a bully and gave everyone a hard time, as did his media staff. I mean, Steve Murphy was formidable, not quite as formidable as Nikki Sava when she was working for Peter Costello, but he was formidable and you got punished. If you didn't toe the line, you were punished. You were punished by having access withdrawn, you didn't get stories, you had to hear about them when other media were given them, and it was ruthless. Uh, the cup of tea interview, which is what that was a slight excerpt of, was on the last day before the polls 20 years ago when he lost power. Uh, and he abused me for, I mean, to my face in the studio in front of hundreds of thousands of people, he just abused me personally and professionally. He told me I was pathetic. That's a quote. You're pathetic. You're just pathetic. And uh, it was quite clear to me that if he was returned to power, then my... You know, my tenure in the job was over because if I didn't have access to the Premier from time to time, I couldn't do my job and I was, I was gone. So, you know, I didn't have any qualms in asking him the various questions about things that were going on that no one else had dared ever to put to him and history is the judge. What's your personal reaction to something like that? Do you love that? Do you get the bit between your teeth and just say, this is why I'm here? Or is there any moment when you're in the shower and you're looking at yourself and you're hopefully not in the shower, <laughs> you're thinking about yourself. <laughs> that's bad too. <laughs> where are the mirrors you, in your bathroom, where, Mary? <laughs> and you say there was that the moment of self-doubt. Do you have that self-doubt? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, the only person I've ever met without self-doubt is Eddie Maguire and I don't know how he gets away with it, but, you know. <laughs> Eddie Maguire's better at being Eddie Maguire than I am at being John Fane, and I, I kind of, you know, it sounds vain, but I'm pretty good at being John Fane, but boy, that's, that's at another level. Um, yeah, you, you have both. They're not actually either or, and you have moments of self-doubt, and you have to push them out of your mind, and you have to be kind of what actors call in the moment. Uh, I mean, when I talk to, when I was allowed to, I'm not anymore, when I used to talk to young broadcasters at the ABC, um, I used to say to them, it's a three and a half hour performance on a tightrope without a safety net, and if you come out of the studio and you're not sweating, you haven't done it properly. You know, you've just got to be really, really intense. And when you're locking eyes with a Jeff Kennett or a John Howard or, you know, even the incumbents, it doesn't matter, it's, you know, it, it, it's like the mongoose and the cobra, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to you're trying to get something from them. You're trying to control the traffic. You're trying to make sure that they're not dodging and weaving and getting away from you. You've got to keep on track. 
Um, I'm not a great one for, I don't write intros, I don't write questions, I don't do any of that. I just really rely on concentrating really, really hard. Um, by Friday afternoon, I go home, I curl up in the fetal position and howl at the moon. You know, you're exhausted by the end of the week and if, if you're not, you know, there's something wrong with you. And yes, you do have self-doubt. Um, I don't think I, I might have said this before, but the Kennett interview, um, Stephen Main had, for those who are new to this, Stephen Main had been a press secretary to Alan Stockdale. He'd resigned. He'd set up a website in the very early days. It was called jeft.com. He'd published a whole lot of... Um, what were dismissed as rumours or untruths, you'd call them fake news these days. He published a whole lot of material which the um, Kennett government brushed aside. They'd actually never been asked to formally respond to them. In media circles, people were going, oh, but publicly there'd been nothing. And the night before, when I knew I had the Premier and I'd had Steve Brax the day before, and you know everyone's forgotten, but I gave him a pretty hard time too. And I sat in the backyard, I stared into the middle distance and I thought, well, if I'm, if I'm worth having in the job at all, I've got to ask him these questions, otherwise I may as well, you know, if I'm, if I'm too gutless to ask the questions about Jeff.com, I may as well give up. If I do ask them, and almost certainly Kenneth will be re-elected, well, I'm toast anyway, so either way, <laughs> I'm going to be looking for another job, I may as well at least go out with my head held high, having asked the questions no one else dared ask. And... Um, I, without consulting the ABC's lawyers, which I might say I think, sorry Warwick, the truth be known, um, I have often avoided doing because their default setting is no, you can't ask that, um, without asking or seeking anyone's permission. And my producer at the time, the wonderful Prani West, was very close personally to Steve Murphy, the Premier's press secretary, so I didn't tell Prani I was going to ask these things because I thought she'd tip them off. Maybe fairly or unfairly, but either way, I just decided I wouldn't share it with her. And I prepared the material, but I didn't put it to Kennett as in, are these questions true? I didn't do that. I said to him, and the, if you listen back, the question is, why haven't you sued Stephen Main for defamation over what he's published on jeft.com? And his answer was, oh, are you you're doing Stephen Main's dirty work for him, are you? To which the answer was, no, I just want an answer to my question. Why haven't you sued him? Because that leaves people wondering if you're afraid of this being tested. And then he said, and this was the golden moment where, as Michael Kroger says, we play this to all aspiring politicians on what not to do, Kennett dares me, live to air, to repeat the material on jeft.com. So I do. Thank you, Jeff. And so I say, well, the allegations are that there was a tender given in the transport department, which was given to the minister's daughter without it going out for competition. There are questions being asked about your wife getting preferential allocation of shares in the transurban float. And I, he kept going, have you finished? Have you finished? Are you going to keep going? You keep going, I'll just sit here and drink my tea. And that was the moment. And, you know, I didn't know it was going to go that way. I couldn't believe it. I thought, surely he's got a better answer than that. But he didn't. I'm conscious that you guys want to grill him as well. So just a couple more questions, a couple more personal questions, and strangely bathroom-related as well, this one. <laughs> a few weeks ago in your conversation now, you were talking about ethics and what it and how it means to be an ethical person. And you said it was about when you look in the mirror and you're brushing your teeth, what you think of yourself, what, what the reflection that comes back. Has that changed for you, your thoughts about your reflection in your time being a broadcaster? And if so, how? On what it means to be ethical? On judging yourself. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd sum it up by saying that now I, I, I encourage everyone to use your powers for good, not evil. Uh, and I, I, I've always struggled with the, the notion of people in the media having power because I've seen how it corrupts people. Have I mentioned Alan Jones was corrupt and unethical? But, you know, we've got this problem where having a microphone or a camera or a masthead is an unbelievable privilege. And even though the media now is disaggregated and you know, lots of people can have lots of ways of communicating with a mass audience, there's still nothing quite like it. I mean, I've got somewhere between, I don't know, four, five 500,000 people listening to me right across Victoria, southern New South Wales, northern Tasmania, over to Mount Gambier, people on, you know, 
catch up, all that sort of stuff. And if you do stop and think about that, it's terrifying. So I kind of try to go, well, you just go in there, you do the best you can, afterwards you hope you haven't made a fool of yourself and you go home and get ready to do the next one. And we know that you guard your family's privacy very fiercely. Yeah, but they, I just wondered they, if they never asked for this. No, they didn't. So they'll be happy on Monday? Jan will be very happy, yeah. <laughs> but could you finish this sentence at least for us? At work, John is the fearless, ruthless, forensic, inquisitor, conversation leader. At home, he is... Time poor. <laughs> um, what am I? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I guess I'm always apologising uh, because work intrudes far too much and I don't think I'm Robinson Crusoe in this company. Um, for many of you, I'm sure, your job is, is a lifestyle. It's not just a job. Um, we fire up, we're passionate about it. I'm endlessly apologetic. Um, the interruptions, the intrusions, um, you know, Jan and I will be sitting having a cup of tea and a cake on some beach somewhere and someone will walk up and say, oh, are you who I think you are? Oh, I've ever told you what happened to me when we came back from Vietnam. Have you got a minute? And, you know, I understand totally people want to do that, but Jan will just get up and walk away. And I'm more interested in following her than hearing about what happened when they came back from Vietnam. That's not dismissing what happened to people when they came back from Vietnam. It's just that you've got to have balance in your life. And um, avoiding divorce, dementia, disease, whatever, um, that's very important to me. So, you know, and Jan, I, I, you know, she was going to come today and then probably to <laughs> good effect she changed her mind, but I, I, you know, I'm more than indebted to her every minute of every day and I, I've got absolutely no doubt that I'll, you know, I'll do the wink with Tony Abbott and I'll come home and say, hey, you won't believe what happened today and she'll say, I don't care, pick up the dog shit in the garden and we've run out of toilet paper or something. And so, you know, that keeps you real. And I, you know, she's fabulous and I, I couldn't have done it without it. Well, that's an enduring image of you that we will now carry with us. Thank you very much. A round of applause for John Fain. And now I think it's the time that you guys should put up your hands. This is your chance. Oh, good, there's no questions. That's good. <laughs> oh, Kathy Ball. <laughs> she's got one. Hello, John. Hello, Cathy. So it's probably 10 years since I was at the ABC, so I feel like I can ask this one now. Talking about <clears throat> the sort of people who can have access to the microphone, have that sort of power that you've talked about, and not be anodyne and apologetic. One of my disappointments in listening to the ABC, and I'm still an avid ABC fan, is the amount of times they have an opp opportunity to maybe get someone to fill in if you're away or in the afternoons, and they get people from outside of the ABC they bring in comedians. I've got nothing against comedians. But I just wonder whether you have a view about whether the ABC should look more close to home when they're looking to backfill holiday times and, and bring some of the great talent from within the newsroom and the 7.30 and those places and give them an airing. Uh, how much were you paid to ask that question and who by? <laughs> I've got a fair idea. Um, yes and no. Um, the prov the absolutely overwhelming consideration in deciding who's on air should be who's best, whether they're inside or outside. And one of the things that management do, and several of those people are here in the room, they also use those opportunities to give people flying hours, to try out talent, sometimes, in my view, um, too early. I mean, sometimes you can destroy potential talent by putting them to air too early and, and they're not, they haven't got the flying hours or they haven't got the confidence or the insight yet. So it's a delicate art. At the same time, there are other considerations, in particular, um, more women on air, younger people on air, and people from more diverse backgrounds, and I agree with all of those as well and nurturing the new talent. I mean, we use the conversation hour, the co-hosting there very much as a way as a test bed, and I have loved doing that. Um, we picked up this young guy who came from community radio and television. Um, he did okay on the convo hour. We thought he was worth giving a bit more work to, and um, Waleed Ali has kicked on rather well, you know? 
And that's exactly what we should be doing. And we should be looking for people, we should be finding the next generation and nurturing them and passing on, hopefully, our version of what it means to be a broadcaster on air and see where they, where they end up. But yes, there are some great people in-house. Um, I don't want to sound too mean, but there are also people in-house who have unrealistic expectations. And, you know, there's only, you know, how many jobs are there on air? And there's hundreds of people internally and thousands of people overall who all think that could be me. Well, how do you manage that? So, yeah, it's not easy. Not easy at all. I do want more time spent on training at the ABC, though. I'm quite happy to go on the record saying that. I think there's a lot of very basic training, but there's almost nothing at the kind of, you know, top end of, OK, we think you're ready for something like this, and it's basically sink or swim. I don't think that's good enough anymore, either. Always. Um, Louise Adler, so John, I wanted to just, um, as a Melbourneian who's listened to you probably for all of the 30 years. You want me to write a book? No, that comes. Well, we're, that's already done. That's already done. We've done the deal. Yeah. No, we haven't done the deal. No. I, I, no. Told you, I told you I'd test you to see how far you'd chase because I cannot really see how I'd want to spend 30 years at the ABC and then as soon as I leave, relive it all by writing a book. But there you go. This is called foreplay, but anyway. Yeah. So... Um, two. And, it's, and as Lizzie Fox told us the other day, it's the relationship that counts, not the foreplay. <laughs> well, you know, that's an ethno-specific response, so we'll, we'll leave that there. So, a couple of points. So, as a Melbourne, Not sure who's flirting with who now. <laughs> we right? know, but, no, we know each other too well. But a couple of points I wanted to make. First is that uh, I'm, all of us in this room would have, you know, key moments, seminal moments, when you've really done an extraordinary interview, and I think... I will never forget the Stephen Guest interview and how important that was and how that debate continues to be vital. The other moment I can never, um, well, actually, every time I need to go to the bank, I think of it, was the lady who rang up and said, I'm having problems with my PIN number. And you said, Madam, it's not a PIN number, it's a PI number or it's a PIN. And I felt her being crushed on air as I was crushed myself. And there's not a time I don't go to the bank or the ATM without thinking, is it a PIN number? It's a PIN. There's John Fain. Anyway, so that were two points. And then the third point, which is a serious point, which is to say, and far be it for me to speak on behalf of the book publishing industry, but I will today. I don't know if there are any other representatives here. But to say that when John Fain interviews an author and talks about a book, the impact on Victorian and New South Wales readers has been extraordinary and the effect is immediate, that people will listen to you talking to an author and directly go to Dimex or, um, or, or Readings or anywhere else or, you know, the Avenue Bookshop and say, John Fain had someone on, I can't remember who it was and I don't remember his name or her name and I don't remember the title of the book, but it was on the Fain program, can I see a copy of that book? So the effect of a Fain interview on the book publishing industry has been huge and well known and document, documented. So I wanted to say thank you for that and to ask you whether there was... Is there was a question? <laughs> it's a See, comment. Mary, I was expecting It's a comment. That. It's a comment, but there is a question, which is, was there an author that you adored talking to? Oh, millions. Millions. Uh, can you... Um, and it's been... I mean, th those clips before... I mean, I have to say this. Um, I've never listened back to any of Black Saturday and just even seeing that little bit of it on the screen there before made kind of, well, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, along with Jill Maher's death. Um, authors, I mean, some of them are fabulous and some of them are just unbearable. And, you know, there's a Who real... Who are the unbearable ones? Come on. Oh, Geoffrey Archer, just what a tosser. <laughs> what a tosser. Unbelievable. He said live to air, he said, Who booked me on this show? It was a mistake. And that's your badge of honour, surely. Oh, yes! <laughs> But, uh, you know, you get your Frank McCourts and, I mean, local authors as well. You just fall in love with people and you can't wait for them to come back and have another chat. And, you know, I've interviewed Peter Carey that many times. He sort of comes in and says, oh, you're still here sort of thing. And I love that. Um, I won't be next time he comes round. But I've really, really enjoyed that. And the great frustration has actually been having to read a book just for an interview and if anyone here has ever had to do that, you know how different that is to reading it for pleasure. And I'm I have a massive... I've got a whole shelf in 
uh, in the study of books that I've put to read properly. And that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to being able to do. And, and I mean, I don't know, what, what on earth was I doing talking to Jane Fonda? Why not? I mean, how weird is that? Well, she was Barbarella. She's oh, been I, a few things since then. Uh, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> in my mind, she's Barbarella and, you know... <laughs> Well, I, I think that tell says you more what about 14-year-old boys her. thought of Barbarella. You can work it out for yourselves. And, you know, there, there are moments like that and you just go, I, I can't believe this. John Cleese, you, you know, I was on stage with him at the theatre when he did his thing and, and here at the press club. And you're like, you know, John Cleese was a god when I was growing up. And you go, wow, how extraordinary. And I don't think I'm that interesting. I do an interesting job and I do it as well as I can. And you get those opportunities and it's been an absolute blast. A question over here. John, Barry Donovan. Hello, Barry. Melbourne Press Club. First of all, congratulations on your terrific performance over all those years. It's been, it's been great. Um, my only real problem now is with now that Hendo's gone and you're about to go, who do we believe? And Barry Cassidy? Uh, well, I'll, yeah. put, I'll put Hendo and, I'll put Hendo and you ahead of uh, Professor Cassidy, who was apparently speaking tonight at R RMIT. Okay. But, but my actual more serious question to you is, um, is the, uh, the new leader of the ABC has in recent times. Um, Ida's had a terrific background, obviously with contacts. He's worked with the Packers. She's uh, run a very successful Women's Weekly. What I'd be interested in asking you now is how optimistic are you about uh, Ita's future performance and her role and her ability to move things uh, in a really positive direction for the ABC. I think it's been a, uh, a, a terrific appointment, lateral, very lateral apparently, she wasn't even on the list, but um, she's showing absolutely at this stage that she's interested, she cares, she's involved. Um, all the feedback that we all get is that she's saying all the right things and with David Anderson as the managing director, I think the ABC's got a really good team in place. Um, whether the new minister is to be kindly disposed and is prepared to listen to the ABC's, uh, I think, justified and not exaggerated requests for a fresh look at the inadequacy of our funding, whether there's any appetite in government for that, I've no idea, but I certainly hope so. And if the projected uh, budget shortcomings start to bite, then um, even when they don't have to pay my vastly bloated salary because I've gone, um, there still won't be enough money to go around and there's going to be some difficult times, not in the rest of this financial year, but the one after, I understand. But um, I'd hate to see even further cuts at the ABC because those of us who work there know it only survives at the moment on unpaid overtime and the goodwill of the staff, and that's not good enough. John, now you're in trouble. The microphone goes to someone who knows you very well, knows where all the bodies <laughs> oh, are Oh, gee, look, that must be time for the news. <laughs> uh, so... Um, this I've is Katrina Palmer, oh, my senior producer, and someone who's worked at 3LO as long as I have. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. Around so the old. Um, so, I just want to say thank you for you know, everything you've done. It's been fantastic working with you in the last couple of years. But um, what I want to know is, how do you maintain your lack of cynicism every day? Um, you face into these stories and they come round and around and it's hard sometimes not to feel like um, overly cynical about the state of the world and the state of news and the state of politics and so forth. How do you do that day in, day out? Thank you, and thank you for not asking all the other much more difficult to answer questions that you could have. Um, I'm essentially an optimist, and even though there's lots of bad things happening, I'm unable, I, I don't see glass half empty, I see glass half full. I'm um, convinced, and uh, cynicism brings out a really negative and uh, a nasty side to people. I try never to succumb to it. I always correct people when they say I'm cynical and I say, no, I'm not, I'm sceptical. And I think that's a good thing. Cynicism's a bad thing. And the difference between the two is, is more than just semantics. It's actually a mindset. Um, there are lots of reasons why we should think there are people trying to do bad things all the time, but at the same time, I'll always give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, whoever I've had Barneys with, and there's been plenty of them, I mean, I don't think they're bad people. I don't think, you know, 
Tony Abbott winking at me and whatever you think of his politics, he's not a bad person. He's a very conservative person. I'm not. I'm quite progressive. But he's not a bad person and so on. And um, y You meet people in politics, you agree on almost nothing, but it doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means they've got a different world view and they've got a different, um, a different plan. So um, the number of people who I think are actually bad, who I've interviewed, um, well, Judy Moran, I think we can all agree. Um, and if you want to know what's in the book that's been perpetually suppressed, I do have my copy. I kept it just before the pulping order went out. But um, there's very few people in the world who are actually out to really, you know, do harm. Just a handful. And hopefully, uh, you know, a bit of pressure, a bit of exposure, it finds them out. Um, and... Yeah, cynicism, well, if you feel yourself tipping into that, you probably need a holiday. And I'm a great believer in holidays, I might say. And for people who don't know, I, I get a few and I take them all and I take them joyously because I think they keep you going. In fact, I got long service leave when I took long service leave when it was given, when, it, when I negotiated for it. Um, it was, what, 11 or 12 years ago now. I took six months off. I went for a drive. I drove from Melbourne to London with our younger son and... Um, wrote a book about it, Louise, uh, and <laughs> uh, that six-month break, at the time there were lots of people, including in the ABC and some outside, who said, that's it, you'll never come back, you'll never get your job back, you'll never be able to get back into it, and that's a huge mistake, and it's precisely the opposite, and with hindsight, everything I hoped for was true, which was it gave me a, a fresh outlook, it gave me a new lease of, of energy, and it, it meant greater longevity and I'm a great believer in taking your holidays, being made to take your holidays if you're an employer. If someone doesn't take holidays, I think you should be very suspicious. And taking long service leave to extend your working career, uh, I never would have got you know, to this age in this job if I hadn't taken that time off. Question here. Uh, Peter Bartlett, moving away from holidays, um, you mentioned Alan Jones, uh, who's probably been sued more times than anyone in the country and is also very litigious. Uh, you mentioned Jeff Kennett, who was very litigious during his premiership. Uh, what's the greatest legal challenge you've had? Um, we had to enter into a secret settlement with, oh, <laughs> that's a gag. Um, I've been sued. Lawyer humour, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> hilarious. Um, I've been sued by premiers. Uh, I've been sued by ministers in the government. Um, at one mediation with a minister in a government, I had to point out to him that the ridiculous defamation he was claiming, which was of such insignificance and such a minor slight, that it really wasn't worth worrying about. Um, if we indeed did pay him a fraction of the absurd amount he was seeking, it could only look like a corrupt payment between the ABC and a minister of the Crown. And surely he'd be satisfied with a grovelling apology on air instead, which he then, on his lawyer's advice, um, not your firm, uh, he then agreed to accept and then they came back with uh, an assessment of their legal costs that was more than the damages he was seeking, <laughs> which I'm sure is no novel experience for lots of the people in this room. That was hilarious. Oh, sorry, Peter, that's not fair to make a joke about lawyers' costs. Um, the greatest challenge is probably um, the gobbo suppressions. Uh, I've been outspoken about the Royal Commission at the moment. That's been extraordinarily hard. Some of the interviews I've done with Graham Ashton have required uh, extraordinary preparation and the Pell trial and keeping up with it, staying accurate and fair and across the details of what had happened as well as what could and couldn't be publicly said required uh, a tenacity that tested me. Uh, and, yeah, those are huge issues and to have them the problem of being three and a half hours on air and live to air and daily means you just don't have the luxury that a lot of other people in the media have of you know consulting Justin or you or whoever else they need to to find out what you can and can't and you know polishing a paragraph or whatever you just you know you just you're going live to air um, so yeah that, that's been really tough um, but I love it for that reason and and I don't I don't back down from a word I've said about uh, the Gobbo Royal Commission, even though I've had a few eyebrows raised from various legal quarters. And uh, I, 
I think it's at danger at the moment of Im imploding in on itself. Uh, and you know, you only get a you get an opportunity once in a in a generation to clean out a, a police force, and it looks like we might be mucking ours up. You know, Queensland did a really good job with Fitzgerald, West Australia, South Australia, New South Wales. We've got an opportunity here to really apply the blowtorch to some of the most ridiculous and appallingly inappropriate things that have been going on behind the scenes in Victoria Police. We always thought we were better. We always thought our cops were better. Turns out. There's been shocking things going on. There are trials that have been manipulated, evidence that's been manipulated, extraordinary breaches of every level of the criminal law and procedure, and there's little sign so far that this Royal Commission is going to come to grips with it, and that's really disappointing. Now, as time is running out, the mic has gone to another former producer, Andy Burns, so maybe this is where the uh, bodies get exhumed. <laughs> um, is this thing on? Uh, just a quick comment and then a question. Um, I just wanted to point out as a apostate of your program, and um, I get used to get asked all the time, what's he like? What's he really like? And I wanted people in the room and more broadly to know that you've been a fantastic champion of women at the ABC in particular. Um, so many fantastic female producers have come through your program and gone on to do other things, including your amazing team at the moment. And so as... And, and they haven't all ended up pregnant. <laughs> Uh, yes. We were a baby machine for a while, weren't we? Andy, it's an unfortunate Ashlyn. thing that women do sometimes. No, it was... It, it actually, <laughs> Again, an unfortunate one of, the office, one of the office chairs got called the pregnancy chair. I have sat in it. It happened to me. Um, and the only person who didn't end up pregnant was Nicole Chavastic. So anyway, <laughs> the other thing is that we could have a really good head-to-head -head argument at 5.30 in the morning and John would sit there as a, you know, an elder statesman, a really old person, and let a young Turk like me take it to him and listen to me and actually have a dialogue which you don't see all the time when you're in the media. So thank you for being a champion of women and thank you for being a, one of the best bosses I ever had. Thank you, Andy. I love you. <laughs> love you too. That said... <laughs> What's he really like? Um, you have certain constraints being at the public broadcaster. Every man and his dog accuses you of having some bias. What is something that you really want to say that you just can't say because you've got to work at the ABC? Now's your time. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not. Now is the time. No, it's not. Um, I'm not intending to burn the place down and trash it on the way out the door. And I worked for the ABC until officially uh, Monday the 14th of October. Uh, and I think it would be profoundly disrespectful to the ABC to betray all of that just because I'm finishing up. That would be a great indulgence. And thank you for the invitation, but I won't take it. Um, Boo. There's, yeah. Um, there, uh, and another thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to be one of those people who leaves the ABC and then starts kind of bagging it or telling people what they should have done or any of that and being a ghost you and You do that around. while we're here. <laughs> Very good, Mary. Um, I think that would be inappropriate as well. I've I had think that market is cornered. Hey? I think that market is cornered. Yeah. And I've had a blast. I've had an extraordinary run and I joined the ABC to do the law report. Um, no great secret here. I thought I was going to be a barrister and it would be good for a barristerial career to do a few years where I would help build my profile and that way I'd get more work when I went to the bar. I even had the forms that filled them in. I'd approach someone to read with them. And then I started being asked to fill in for Doug Ayton on 3LO Drive and then I got asked to do some other fill-ins and I thought, shit, this is fun. So then they asked me if I wanted to swap over and go from Radio National to 3LO and do talk radio. So I did that and I thought, this is so much fun. And then when uh, I got sacked, and then Sue Howard asked me to come back a few years later when I'd done some television and investigators and wise up. And uh, she asked me to come back and I said, no, uh, I've got to get it out of my system. I've got to get serious about my legal career. I've got family. I've got to, you know, stop mucking around dabbling and pretending that there's something in this media bullshit. So I said, no. Um, she came back. She wasn't quite as persistent as Louise Adler, but she was pretty good. And she offered me a two year contract so I said, all right, I'll try and do four years and then I'll go back to the law. 
And if there was any way to have more fun, I reckon I'd go and do it, but there just isn't. And that's why I've kept doing it. It's just such a blast. It really is. And to hold power to account, at the same time to play with the celebrities and, you know, to be finger on the pulse on the life of a great city like this, it's, it's been incredible. We are running out of time. So let's Thank pretend... God for that. Let's pretend it's just a few minutes to the top of the clock, so we're going to have to be quick about these ones. Just a quick question. Have you got any unfinished business in your mind? With... With this broadcasting media. career? Yeah. No, no. I'm, I mean, this hasn't happened to me. It's been driven by me. I tried to resign two years ago. Jan and I were on holidays. We were in Nova Scotia. Um, we did the Cabo Trail and all that sort of stuff, and we were driving around, and I said, you know, I think I've, I've had enough, and she went, oh, thank God. <laughs> And I came back and I told the then boss, Warwick over there, that I wanted to finish and he effectively said, well, we want you to do the next state and federal election and they persuaded me with no pay rise at all to do another two years. And so I said I'd do the state and federal election and I also said, but don't count on me doing every day of every week of every month of the second year in that two years. Once the election's out of the way, we'll find a date. I tried to finish on my birthday in September um, which didn't suit everybody, including Virginia, so I'm finishing next Friday. And um, I, don't, I don't have any regrets because I've driven this. It's been my decision. And I know it's going to be hard. I know, you know, you get habituated to the adrenaline and the, the role, the conversations, the collegiality that, that Andy and Katrina have so generously referred to. I love that. I love it. But I'll miss it, but I've chosen to do that. So I, I, I hope I can cope. Next to last question, is this going to be the end of you and the ABC? Have you got any idea of what you're doing next year and would you consider coming back and helping? You've been talking a lot about training the ABC and improving the ABC. Uh, look, I have pitched a 10-part series on swap meets and car museums of the world. <laughs> Why did I know that was coming? And I've sort of said it's a bit like Backroads, a bit like, you know, Macca. It's got a whole lot of different elements to it. I just can't find the right person in the organisation to share my enthusiasm, so no, I, I, I can't see. I mean, I've got the best, I have the best job of any. I've got the best job in the best organisation in the best city in Australia as far as I'm concerned. That's how I see the morning show on ABC Radio Melbourne in Melbourne. I don't want to, I grew up in Sydney, I don't want to live in Sydney. If I'm going to live in Melbourne, I don't want to work for another organisation. If I'm working at the ABC, I've got a great face for radio, I'm not a television person. And if I'm working in radio, I've got the best gig. So there's nothing better. There just isn't. Now, I have to officially out you, finally, as Eric from North Fitzroy. <laughs> he apparently has been a pest on talkback lines. So, Neil no, Mitchell... No. On can, the texts. On, on the, the texts. texts. On yeah. the texts. Will you continue the career of Eric from North Fitzroy? Um, Eric sent the odd text in, particularly on Monday nights. I'm in the car because on Monday nights we go and, and cook dinner for my very elderly parents who are still at home at 93, and in the car on the way home, I sometimes hear David Astle, uh, you know, talking about what was the best venue for bands in the 70s or something, and I'll text in. Um, I've, I've got Raf to read one or two out as well, which is kind of fun. Um, but no, I, I more see it as a bit of mischief, which is entirely in keeping, isn't it? But um, I, I, I'm not going to be a talkback caller, no. I mean, think about it. Oh, come on, you'd love it. No, no. No, you I could don't say everything that you wanted to say <laughs> that way. And in terms of the training, look, I, I, I haven't been asked and um, the last person in charge of training at the ABC uh, who did ask me was Karen Buck and she got me to come and do a session where apparently in my training session for the new broadcasters I contradicted every single thing she'd been teaching them <laughs> and I was never asked to come back. So uh, if, if there are lessons I can pass on and tricks that I can... In, um, can, in, that can endure, then I'm very happy to do so. Well, John, on behalf of everyone here, I'm sure everyone just wants to give you their thanks, their appreciation, obviously not just for today but <laughs> and 30 years. And as a colleague, I just wanted to echo what Michael had to say. You are not just one of the sharpest brains, but you are that sharp standard to which we can all bring to mind at any given time. Your voice will be in our heads for, for the better. Uh, I don't, to keep don't know what us, you've to done to deserve that. But no. To keep us on track. No, thank you. It's been a blast. And, and when Mark asked me if I would come along and do this, I mean, quite literally, I said, I, I really can't see 
why anyone would come along and I, I'm enormously flattered that people have bothered to pay money to come and hear me talk rubbish. So thank you very much and um, love yous all. Thank you to John Fain.